The designer of the Enterprise, Walter Matt Jeffries. This is episode 41. Listening to 70s Trek with Bob Turner and Kelly Casco, the fan podcast that looks at Star Trek in the 1970s. It was the decade that built a franchise. He's known as the man who designed the USS Enterprise NCC 1701 and really came up with the look of Star Trek. I'm Bob Turner. And I'm Kelly Casto. This week, we're talking about Matt Jeffries. Without him, Star Trek would not be the show we know today. No, it certainly wouldn't. But before we talk about Matt, we want to tell you how to reach us. Sure. You can go to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash 70s Trek. We hope you'll leave us a comment or a question while you're there. You can also send us an email to 70s Trek at gmail.com. And you can also go to our show page on iTunes by searching 70s Trek in the podcast section. And if you leave a rating or a review, it will help other fans find the show. You know, as we were preparing for this show, I really had the desire to get this one right. Matt Jeffries was a really important person in the history of Star Trek. I mean, as a kid in the 70s, when I daydreamed about Trek, it was Matt Jeffries' design of the Enterprise that I tried to draw. Is he Gene Roddenberry, the creator? No. But, you know, when it comes to important contributors, I think he's right at the top. Oh, absolutely. Gene's name's right there, right? Gene Roddenberry. But it's the Enterprise that really sucked me in. Right. And I did. Absolutely did. I, I can't tell you how many times I tried to draw the Enterprise. <laughs> I couldn't draw, so I just did models of it. and From memory, you know, trying to draw. Oh, I just saw it you know, on the show. I, can, I think it's got that. And I would add, like I would look for new things every time I would watch it. And anyway, hey, you, you took a look at Matt's history before uh, the show. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Okay. Walter Matthew Jeffries Jr. um, was born August 12th, 1921, and he was born in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. They moved eventually to Virginia, where his father was a chief engineer at a power plant. So there's some of his technical background. Right. He gets it honestly. Right. Uh, Growing up, he had a huge passion for aviation, and he, he would build models. Now back then it was balsa wood. And you know, they'd come imprinted, the balsa would come imprinted with, you know, what you cut out and everything. He didn't use that. He would just, you know, do it from either looking at a picture or from memory or whatever. And he basically constructing these models from scratch. He was doing it early on, creating early on. Yeah, absolutely. And the attention to detail was just incredible. Um, and, you know, he, he, in his biography, it even says his his designs were aerodynamically superior. They flew higher, remained aloft longer, and survived uh, crash landings with minimal damage. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And I, thought, I thought that was, you know, good background to, you know, everything we're going to be talking about. Right. He also was a huge sci-fi fan. He followed the Buck Rogers uh, comic strip, uh, the dailies that they had back then. Uh, from the time it started in 1929, you know, all the way through, I'm sure. Um, big fan of Jules Verne, H.G. Uh, Wells, you know, Flash Gordon also had that same run that Buck Rogers had with the, the daily comics and, and everything. Um, so he's getting his sci-fi background, honestly, too. Right. Uh, so when he graduated high school in Richmond, Virginia, he enrolled in the – and let me read this. I thought the name was interesting. The 1st Regiment of the Virginia Grays. 
Um, it's an infantry National Guard unit. Now, the war breaks out, and he decides he wants to get into the Army Air Corps. Now, he rose to the rank of tech sergeant in uh, the National Guard unit. He took a discharge, and a short discharge, then re-enlisted into the Army, and finally um, got onto or got into the B-17 school. Um, he proceeded to go to England in the summer of 1942, and then um, served in Africa um, and Sicily and Italy. He flew uh, as a co-pilot and an engineer. Um, in B-17s, B-24s, 25s, and 26. But what he's probably more famous um, for is as a co-pilot over Africa uh, in his B-17, uh, he, he, they ran into a, a German fighter plane. You know, how, how that happened, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but they survived. The plane didn't crash. They actually were able to do a lit um, actual land it um, in an ally airstrip while it's there they totally stripped it and um, methodically rebuilt it Gosh. they stripped all the arm armament and weapons and everything and then that that plane and it's called um, all American uh, the, the plane's name was mm -hmm. they all have names right mm -hmm. Uh, that crew then, and he was, again, engineer and pilot, flew over Europe on special missions or secret missions. They was... actually took – they had pictures of the plane oh, man. Um, and they used it to help sell war bonds. Wow. Wow. So like Gene Roddenberry, like Jimmy Doohan, we have another war hero. Exactly. That's impressive. So impressive. It is. And, you know – for his wartime service, he earned um, the Air Medal, which Roddenberry had, and the Bronze Star. So, kind of interesting. After the war, uh, he served as a tech inspector for the Air Force uh, until his enlistment was up. And, you know, even though, you know, he had this near-death experience, it didn't hampen his enthusiasm for aviation at all. He went and got an apprenticeship uh, under a New York illustrator, William um, Hayslip, and he became an aviation illustrator at an air, aircraft manufacturer. As an illustrator, he worked for the aircraft manufacturer, as I stated, Airco. Um, he, 48, he took an illustrator position at the Library of Congress. Uh, four years later, he decided to go on his own and become a freelance aviation illustrator now as this freelance aviation illustrator he got his very first nationwide recognition as an illustrator by doing a, a cutaway of a Seversky p-35 airplane mm -hmm. which was in a magazine hobby mag um, it, it was a hobby magazine for for uh boys but you've seen those right um, those cutaways the uh, you know, where they yeah. show you the interior of what the engine looks like and the seats and the dash and, you know. And those things right. were huge after World War II because kids' fathers flew those or talked about those or worked on those. And so, yeah, those kinds of illustrations, that, those were a big deal. They, Yeah, they were huge. And it's so much so that he could be a freelance aviation illustrator. Wow. Now, now he had a good year in 1956. So he became an, uh, an honorary U.S. Navy Blue Angel. Hmm. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of cool. Um, but he also got his foot in the door in Hollywood. So he was he was out in, in California doing his illustration stuff. And Warner Brother came to him, and they were looking for some technical input on the X-2 Bell experimental rocket plane mm -hmm. and that they were doing for the movie toward uh, the unknown. So he got he got his foot in the door there. But then later in, in the same year, his younger brother who went on to Hollywood and he was an art director and Philip is his name. Um, 
he brought him in to Warner Brothers to help with a Cold, Cold War movie um, about B-52s. It was called Bombers B-52. Uh, now, Jeffries had, you know, a, a huge hand in that movie because he was kind of sort of a B-52 expert. Um, had an extensive library of B-52 manuals and just, you know, his aviation um, hobby, if you will. Yeah, his background. Hobby. He was able to bring uh, that and, and get the stuff right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, it, just kind of an interesting side note. Philip also later then brought their youngest brother, John, to Hollywood. So they worked together quite a bit. That's neat. Um, he spent a, then most of his next few years in Warner Brother movies, helping with uh, as a technical um, advisor or doing drawings or a set designer. Uh, so, 58, he did Old Man in the Sea. Um, 59, he did The Wreck of the Mary Derry, 1960, The Crowded Sky. Uh, now, in 1960, he moved to Desilu Studios. And so he's now doing set designs on television um, productions uh, where he worked on The Untouchables and then uh, as a set designer. And then Ben Casey. Now, Ben Casey, this is kind of an interesting story. He... Um, is working under Roland Brooks and Roland was the senior art um, director for Desi Lou and Matt's boss, obviously. Uh, you know, Roland got this pilot um, script that came across his desk for the cage. And he's like, there's a lot of work here, a lot of detail. I know just the guy um, on a little break that, that Matt had, while doing Ben Casey, he took like a month off um, to go to the East Coast and do the family thing and just, you know, take some time off. He came back and Roland gave him a bit of a scare. And so in an interview with Matt, he says, um, at that point, my wife and I took a month off, went to the East Coast to visit the family. Uh, we came back and I couldn't find my equipment. You know, my little cubicle was empty. So I went to Bud Brooks' office. Um, that's Roland, obviously. Uh, he says, where's the next Casey script? And he said, you're not on the show anymore. It's <laughs> like he's freaking out, right? Sure. He thinks he's fired. Um, and, and he says, it, it served me right for taking a month's vacation. <laughs> <laughs> um, Roland, having his chuckles, um, he uh, set the record straight with Jeffries. He said, your stuff's in the big drafting room. He said, there's a man coming in this morning by the name of Roddenberry to do a space show. And here I'll turn it over to you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but that's poor so Jeffries. Funny. I know. That's a horrible, horrible practical joke. It's it is. funny. I, I can imagine playing it on someone, but it's a horrible practical joke. Well, you know, when Gene and Matt met, they realized that they both had B-17 experience. And so that was sort of this common bond between them. Um, and then Gene got down to business and he told Jeffries what he was looking for. So let's listen to this from Matt. The job that was handed to me uh, primarily was to come up with a spaceship. About all he said that would help me along was uh, several don'ts such as no flames, no fins, no rockets. And one do is make it look like it's got power. And he walked out. <laughs> so considering the restraints that he did not give me, it was a case that I had to find my own design envelope, which meant I was looking for shape, and I didn't know what the shape looked like. Um, it had to be instantly recognizable. Could you <laughs> imagine that? Yeah, yeah, I want this to look like um, nothing before that we've ever seen in science fiction and nothing that we're doing in NASA. And um, good luck with that. Have something yeah. ready for me in a couple weeks. And it has to look powerful. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it has to be instantly recognizable. 
So these guidelines from Roddenberry are all he's got to work with. So Matt goes <laughs> out and he spends some Desilu money and he buys some books about Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers and he gets some NASA concept art as well that was like flying around that was big in the 50s and early 60s. And he puts all of this stuff on the wall and he says, that is not what I will do. So he kind of had that that negative example to work away from. And then he sat down and he began to sketch shapes. Mike Akuda uh, in an interview was talking about Jeffries, you know, and he described this period this way. He knew that somewhere between the hardware realism of NASA and the fantasy of science fiction magazines, somewhere in there was this starship. And, and he also had a lot of pressure on him because Jeffries knew that if the audience didn't buy the Enterprise right away, this show was going to be sunk. So the process was tough. It was a lot of stress. There wasn't a lot to work with. And he got down to work. It was kind of a trial and error thing. You know, Matt would sketch some shapes and maybe add some things here or there and then go see Gene. And Roddenberry would say, yeah, no, I don't like that, but maybe keep this part or, you know, get rid of everything else, just this little bit. And he would begin to keep a collection of these little bits that Gene liked. And after five weeks, he'd come up with this shape that included all of the elements that Roddenberry had identified. So let's listen to this. I did a very quick rendering on, on black illustration board. And in white, kicked in a little color because it. I was now in a probably the fifth week of frustration. We had sketches and you know, every medium all over the place, just trying to find something. And I finally came up with the the basic design. I thought we had something. Well, after doing that rendering, I I thought, sure, we're going to preload this deal. Everything else looks crude, but we're going to polish this a bit. So he's going to preload the deal. What he decides to do is take this drawing now that he just came up with, and he goes down to the wood shop, and he says, hey, guys, I need to come up with a rough model of this thing. So they laid out a disc shape, and they get some, um, they get some wood, and they laid out the cylinders for the engines and for the engineering section, and they begin to glue it together. So the next day, Roddenberry and the NBC execs come in to see, how are you doing, Matt? What's going on? Do you have anything for us? And he had laid out all of these black and white sketches around this color one that he did, that he was just talking about. And of course, the guys are like, oh, wow, look at that. Isn't that interesting? And they pick it up and they're commenting about it. They seem to like it a lot. And... Matt pulls out the model, and they had tied a string to it. And Roddenberry's eyes light up, and he says, what do you think of this then? And he's, he grabs the string, and he's holding it, and he's like, wow, this is very impressive. And the material that they used to create the engines on top was heavy or heavier than what was underneath, and so it flipped upside down. <laughs> and Roddenberry's eyes got bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeffrey was like, oh, no, that's... It's not the way it's supposed to look, but Roddenberry was like, oh, I think I like this a lot. Look at the way this looks. <laughs> and so Jeffrey's had to kind of, no, that's really not the right design. And, and here's why. And he had to lead him back to the original, you know. But that's how he basically got NBC and Gene Roddenberry to buy the design of the Enterprise. Um, the genius of Matt Jeffries, really, as it relates to Star Trek and the Enterprise design, is that he not only created something so memorable and so believable, but he did it on a television budget. <sighs> I just think it's That's, incredible. It is. So a little, little thing, not exactly related to Matt, but related to this story with Roddenberry and the upside-down model. When the first episode of Star Trek hit the airwaves in 1966, it was the man trap. Um, and of course, TV Guide decided to do a close-up. You remember what a close-up is. Maybe not everybody listening does. Close-up inside the TV Guide was a half-page um, section 
that they would do for special shows or special episodes, you know, a very special blossom. And they would do a close up and, you know, lots of description about what you were going to see that night. Well, they did one for the premiere of Star Trek. That's a big deal. When a show got a close up in TV Guide at that time, big deal, right? Yeah. The photo of the Enterprise was upside down. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, TV Guide. Appreciate that very much. Let's talk about the numbers on the Hall of the Enterprise. You know, um, a lot of people, as you mentioned, think that it related to his plane. His plane was actually purchased after he left Star Trek. So it was complete coincidence that it had some similar numbers to it. Jeffries actually did have, though, a thought process behind NCC-1701. He thought that in the future, it it would take many countries to put a space fleet, like we saw with the Constitution-class starships, together and get them out into space. And you have to remember, he thought this was going to be um, an effort from Earth. This is way before Gene Kuhn came up and introduced the idea of the United Federation of Planets. So he looked at aircraft registration numbers. And in the United States, aircraft registration numbers all begin with the letter N. Now, again, thinking that it's going to take several nations, who's the most likely partner in an endeavor like this? It would be the United States and the Soviet Union in the 60s. Their abbreviation for aircraft registration numbers was CC. So he thought, I'll marry those two together, NCC. So the registration number for the Enterprise began with that. The numbering system was a little, not not quite as lofty. It needed to be very recognizable. The numbers, you had to be able to look at them and say, oh, I know what that is. Unfortunately, on television with very low resolution, threes, sixes, eights, nines, they don't work well. Yes, because they you can confuse them with other numbers or other shapes. And so he decided that, let me start with one seven, very distinctive. And then he came up with this idea why one seven. He thought, well, the Enterprise would be the 17th starship design that the fleet had. Actually kind of a neat idea. Yeah. The 01 followed because he thought that the Enterprise would be a prototype of this 17th design. So 1701 refers to the 17th design, the first ship built in this class. So that's yep. the idea behind the registration number. It wasn't, it wasn't something dreamed up by Roddenberry or, or the producers. It had no deeper meaning than that. And really, in the end, what I just told you is not canon, and so it really doesn't matter. <laughs> In addition to designing the Enterprise, Matt also designed the bridge. Um, he, he knew he had to come up with something that would be striking and different and futuristic looking. And he actually toured an aircraft carrier to see how command centers worked in the military and, this, and, and kind of look at them and say, well, how could this be improved upon? And he saw that they were not thought out very well. Jeffries looked at this and said, well, I know this can be improved upon because, you know, People get in the way of each other. There's no good place to stand, and I have to kind of ask someone to move their chair to walk from here to there. So he thought, wow, a circular uh, arrangement with stations on the perimeter and the commander in the middle, so all he has to do is turn to look at them. He thought that would be a great design. And actually, later on, during the run of the show, the Navy called up the producers and said, hey, we'd like to come in and tour your bridge. And they did. And they were actually looking for ideas and really liked what Jeffries had laid out. And in fact, at one point said, where did you come up with this? And Jeffries said, I, I you know, came up with it on my own. Well, it turns out that later on, after the show went off the air, they called Jeffries back and said, hey, we wanted to tell you, we appreciated you letting us tour your, your bridge. We've created something similar. Um, we'd love to invite you to see it, except that it's in a classified location and you're not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> but they came up with something based on his bridge design for a command center. Kind of cool. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, you know, he also designed all of the interior ship sets. Uh, so everything that you see on the Enterprise is his design. Really? Everything. I didn't know that. In fact, he did a 3D model of all of the interior sets as well, and he made it from foam core. And he did it so he could visualize how the sets would be laid out on the sound stage. And the second reason he did it was so that directors coming into the show would be able to visualize how to make their shots work. Because, you know, if, if a director is going to be on the sound stage shooting a show next week, well, this week when he's coming in, there's already show and production on those sets. So he can't get in. He can't walk the sets. So this way, a director could come in a week before, or two weeks before, see the configuration, get an idea of how he wants to shoot the show, and then be ready next week when it's his turn. Kind of an ingenious idea when you think about it. Yeah, absolutely was. And of course, we all know that there is one set piece that was named after him. You know, in his drawings, Matt called it the engineering power shaft. It's actually referred to by the writers and producers of the show as the Jeffries tube. And of course, that's, that's the place Scotty goes when the Enterprise is about to blow up and he's got to move this cable to that place and, you know, the Jeffries <laughs> tube. And of course, that carries on throughout every version of Star Trek, the Jeffries tube. He also did designs for the set of the week, and these were sets of other ships or other planets or other, you know, offices or complexes or what have you. Uh, Matt designed the Klingon battle cruiser. He designed yeah, different, right. yeah, which is a stunning design, by the way. And you can kind of see if you look at the early iterations of the Enterprise, the Klingon battle cruiser is in some of those shapes. And so when he came up with the battle cruiser, he kind of looked at some of those unused shapes and began to put pieces together, came up with the Klingon battle cruiser. If you're interested in seeing Matt Jeffrey's work, then I highly suggest you get the Star Trek sketchbook because it is full of Matt Jeffrey's set designs, ship designs, all of his sketches of of how he laid things out. And, and it's striking to see that he will have set pieces or set designs that look exactly, exactly like you remember the shots from those episodes. Amazing. It is. Really, really amazing stuff. Um, he was particularly proud of his design for the phaser. He designed the, the hand phaser. Kind of cool there, too. And it is a cool design. It's a cool design. <laughs> you know, when you think about the fact that the handle, and again, it's classic Matt Jeffries. He's a very pragmatic designer. So when you think about a gun, a gun is, is typically a 90-degree angle, you know, and, and the grip is at the back of, of the gun. Right. And what did he do? He created a 45-degree angle for the grip with the weapon going over your hand. It's, it's the grip is placed in the middle of the weapon rather than at the back. So you have right. a firmer grip on it. Interesting idea. Very, very cool design. Um, let's see. This is a quote from Matt uh, as he talks about what it was like working on the show for him. Quote, coming up with ideas was the biggest problem. I liked Gene, but he was really a dreamer. I'm a nuts and bolts man. I guess we were a good balance. Sure, I tell Gene, we'll have doors and glasses and forks in a few hundred years, but what will they look like? What will they be made of? And what things we don't have now, like phasers and so on, what do they look like? There just weren't enough hours in the day or a week for me, unquote. So Star Trek was a really fun experience. Matt enjoyed it a lot, but in the end, to him, it was just another job. He enjoyed it. But when it came to an end, he moved on. And he moved on to work on a lot of shows. They include The Young Lawyers, Barefoot in the Park, Love American Style, When Things Were Rotten, and a show called Father Murphy. And he also worked on a few films, a couple TV movies and films, Weekend of Terror, Escape, The Loneliest Runner, and Killing Stone. But in 1974, Matt was hired by Michael Landon, 
to mm. work on a little show called Little House on the Prairie. And he spent eight years and 195 episodes on that show. And, you know, I, I, I knew, because I remember seeing his name as a kid. I knew he was working on Little House. I had no idea he spent eight years on it. That's a long time. That is. I didn't know that. I thought maybe he set up the, you know, the sets or designed the sets. And he kept designing more and more sets, too. And I guess so, yeah. Yeah, yeah he was the years. art director. So really everything that you see that needed to be crafted or made, those were yeah. his designs. Um, I saw an interview with his brother as I was preparing for this. And his brother said, you know, um, when you watch Little House and you look at the sketches that he came up with for Little House, he said, a lot of that came out of our childhood. We had a grandfather that lived sort of out in the country and that had a lot of this older stuff. I mean, you got to remember how old these gentlemen were, you know, by the time the 70s come around. And their grandparents had been around from the 1800s. So he was able to design a lot on a lot of those things for Little House on the Prairie. Uh, while working on the show still in 77, Paramount greenlighted a new TV show called Star Trek Phase 2. Now, we're going to talk more about that show, of course we will, in a later episode. But as it concerns Matt, Gene wanted him to work on the show. Of course he would. Sure. But, you know, Matt was already committed to Little House. So he agreed to come aboard as a part-time consultant, and of course, Michael Landon gave his approval, and his job would be to update the Enterprise. So this is in June 1977, and Matt turned in drawings of a revised Enterprise that is very similar to what was seen later on in the motion picture. But here's what's really interesting, too, is that he had already made this design back in the 60s when he was working on the original design of the Enterprise. This is the kind of thought process he had. He thought that if this ship was ever to be refit, it would probably be the engines that were going to be refit first. And so rather than, than them being cylindrical, he said, I thought they, I would make them more rectangular and you know, give them a different shape. But his, his thought process was right there. I thought, well, yeah, this could happen because ships get refit, and this seems the most likely thing that would be refit. Right. And so he had these sketches ready to go. He just revised them a little bit yeah. and said, yeah, here's my new design for the Enterprise. Well, just like anything, it's an evolution, not a revolution, so to speak. Yeah, very cool. I thought that was uh, that shows you how forward-thinking he was and how – based in reality, his thought processes were when it comes to his designs for things that aren't even of our world yet. Did that make sense? Incredible. Yes. So also while working on phase two, you know, he designed a new shuttle. He never liked the design of the shuttle. He always thought that because of the cost um, to create a shuttle, that the shuttle was an area where they had to make sacrifices. And, you know, of course, that final design was, was done by somebody else. Gene Whitfield. Yep. So he wanted to come up with a design that looked more like a plane, and he did. It was very aerodynamic, very rounded. And again, if you ever take a look at the Star Trek sketchbook, you can find that design in there. It's a beautiful design. So he designed those as well because he was hoping, hey, maybe I can get this you know, updated shuttle into the Phase 2 show. Of course, Phase 2 um, never came to be, and so his design of the Enterprise was shelved because it was created with TV in mind. TV has, of course, lower resolution than motion pictures, and so the Enterprise, that model, didn't have a lot of detail. But the later designs still incorporated a lot of Matt Jeffries' elements in it. Um, after Little House, Matt worked on an episode of Riptide, and then he did two seasons of Dallas, serving as art director for 44 episodes. And then he retired in 1984. Um, he was honored in the early 2000s by the producers of Enterprise, who referred to a Captain Jeffries as the designer of the NX-01. So his <laughs> name is not only in canon with the Jeffries tube, but also as a designer you know, for, for a starship. 
And, you know, let's face it, when we're talking about Matt Jeffries and we're talking about his designs, we're really talking about the foundation of every Starship design that came after. I mean, you know, okay, so in Star Trek, the original series, we just see other constitutional, constitutional, I said, constitution class designs. (laughs) How about that, huh? The motion picture, we just see some work pods and the Enterprise. But he, later on in Star Trek Three, we see the Excelsior. And what the heck does it look like? A saucer section, two engines that sit out be- up and behind, and an engineering section underneath. It's Matt's design. And, and those elements come in every starship later on. That's a big tribute to him and it's huge. Yeah. And his and his designing uh, forethought. Uh, during his retirement, Matt painted pictures of aircraft in flight, primarily World War II aircraft. And actually, they're, they're really good, and they're really sought after. Like, like people collect these. They're really beautiful paintings. I don't know if you, you came across any as you were doing your work. Yeah, I saw a few of those, yeah. Cool stuff. I mean, he it, really, really was a good artist. Definitely. Um, funny story real quick. You know... He only ever saw the motion picture. He never went to see the other versions of Star Trek that made it to the big screen. And when he saw the motion picture, <laughs> he fell asleep. Um, and he had really, he had one thought to say about the bridge of the Enterprise that he had designed. He thought that they had turned his Navy like bridge into the lobby of the Hilton. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, Matt died of congestive heart failure in July 2003, and he was 81 years old. On our next episode, we'll be taking a look at notable Star Trek guest stars. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening to 70s Trek, an independent fan production. Join us next week as we explore more about the production, the actors, the producers, and the influencers of Star Trek in the Lost Decade of the 1970s on 70s Trek.